Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Schenkel. I'm in the chair of ANC. I would like to uh, welcome you to our May 9th um, ANC meeting. It is really hard to believe that it is May already <laughs> um, in the process. But I would uh, like to call this meeting to order. It is now 6.01 uh, p.m. I see we have three of four commissioners uh, present um, at the moment. And I would like uh, the, if the commissioners could um, introduce themselves. And uh, why don't we start with 2C02. Hi, Becky Strauss. Awesome. Hi, Commissioner Strauss. And 2C04. Hi, I'm Kristen Rowe. Nice to see everyone. Awesome. And uh, I know that uh, Stephen Thomas, um, sorry, <laughs> Stephen Thomas, oh my gosh. Uh, Thomas will be joining us in a few moments. I I'm sure Thomas Lee um, will be joining us. Um, I would, um, we do have a quorum this evening, so we're going to go ahead and proceed. Um, I would like to first uh, just review the agenda for tonight's meeting. Okay. Um, we um, are going to do some business at the at the beginning um, of the meeting this evening. Uh, we will have some community updates, and I see we have both um, um, MPG1 and MPG2 on with us this evening. Uh, we are to have a, um, a presentation from the Office of Unified Communications, 911 and 311 agency update. Um, we will not have a mayor's office presentation this evening. Um, we will have um, an update from uh, Ward 2's uh, council member Brooke Pinto, Pinto's office. We also have uh, two local uh, events that are impacting, that will impact the community. Uh, both are um, one related to the DC Smart Lighting Project, um, the Golden Triangle Business Improvement um, area. Oops. Uh, about uh, an application and a grant that they are uh, receiving or applying for. Uh, we will also, we have one ABRA um, application this evening and uh, uh, four items uh, related to planning, zoning, and environment and historic preservation. Um, are there any other additions uh, to the agenda or modifications, commissioners? I don't think so. Um, are there any um, additions or modifications suggested from the community? Then um, I would like to move that we approve the agenda as I, I would say one thing. I know uh, Nancy Groth sent around some emails about the old balance gym. And I, I don't know if we can just discuss it or add it or if we should add it to the agenda. Um, we can certainly add that to the agenda. I'll put that under other business at the end. Okay. Got it. So I would like to move that we approve the agenda as uh, modified. Seconded. Okay, seconded by Commissioner Rowe. All those in favor, raise your hand. For of four commissioners uh, voting in favor of that. Um, I did distribute the December and January minutes uh, for review and Kristen distributed the April minutes. Um, um, those were just my notes. I actually have not received February, March or April minutes from our note taker. I those are just not. my personal notes. Oh, they're your personal notes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like, um, have you had the opportunity to review the December and January minutes? I think we approved those in the March meeting, Michael. 
Oh, I we did? Commissioner Schenkel, I'm sorry. My bad, my bad. <laughs> I so think they, we did. They resent them to me then, so I apologize. That's okay. Um, um, so they are already approved. Okay, we will move on forward then. Um, Thomas, do you have a treasurer's report and update for us? Let's see, I am going to PNC Bank tomorrow with the document that you provided me, and I'm going to get the signature card so that we can start paying our note taker, our, our minute take, minute maker, minutes maker. Minutes so, maker. What's that saying? Yes. Well, yes. What, what, why do we need the signature card? Uh, I was told that before we can before we can write checks, we need that card so that we. I spoke with Don Dickerson. She said that we needed to have that piece of doc. We need that document from the bank before we can issue any checks. Uh, I think that's the survey document that you have. I I could be wrong about that, but that I don't remember yeah. us signing uh, a signature card. Okay, in that case, uh, I'll, I'll pair it with Don tomorrow and I'll, we'll start paying paying our, our, our vendors. Right, the only thing that we do have to do is have two signatures on the check. Okay, okay. You're pretty close by, I'll run it, I'll run it yep. to you. Awesome. Um, and have you gotten access to the account? Not yet. Not okay, yet. that's what you'll be doing tomorrow then? That's right. Okay, gotcha. Okay, awesome. Um, let's move on to our community announcements. Uh, MPT, MPD2, and we have Lieutenant uh, Garvin with us this evening. I saw him down there. There he is. Uh, good evening. Let me turn my radio down. A lot going on. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Garvin of the seven di mm -hmm. second district. Sorry about that. Um, for the last 30 days, <clears throat> We had four robberies. Um, out of those four robberies, two, um, we made we were able to make two arrests, and the other two robberies are still open. Um, we have um, bolos out, which is just call me over. Just Katie. We have sorry. We have be on the lookouts um, for those individuals. Out of those four robberies, um, we also had two burglaries. Um, we also have bolos out for those two individuals. Um, and one of the bolos um, was actually, I'm sorry, one of the residences was actually a liquor store and the other was actually a shoe store. So we have photos of those individuals that has been disseminated out through our department. Um, and we actually got some good leads on that. Um, we had three gun recoveries um, within the last 30 days and our thefts are up, um, but our thefts are stemming from two of our residential stores. Um, I believe one is Saks Fifth and the other one is, um, I believe H&M. Um, we were able to do an operation at H&M and we actually made three arrests for credit card fraud. So that's something that um, it's a continuous issue, um, but we're, we're being diligent with that. Um, it's so easy, you know, people with all these different scams going on. So um, again, that's what's driving out thefts right now. Um, Saks Fifth, um, H and M, and we also have um, Macy's. Macy's mm -hmm. is is one of our um, bigger. So many different um, points of egress there. They go in, they steal, and they just run out, um, jump on the metro, and they're gone. Um, so that's been a a big thing. So we're going to start moving our operations next down to Macy's, and hopefully we can provide some relief to them. Um, that's all I have. Great, thank you, uh, Lieutenant. Appreciate your update. Can, can I ask? So, for like the burglars of Macy's, how, um, how how much value? Like, are we talking about thousands of dollars worth of things being stolen, or so Macy's the, the loss? So Macy's is is the thefts. These are like snatch and grabs. Um, I don't know if you ever been into the Macy's. I know on the first floor they have the perfume and the colognes and things of that nature. And it's real easy for people to just run in, grab something and run out. So uh, I'm sure the numbers, they get high. <laughs> you know, after a while you have constant people coming in and um, stealing. So I, I would venture off to say that, yeah, they're losing thousands and thousands of dollars. They do have um, 
security or, or loss prevention officers, but I don't I believe that they're not armed. They're just individuals who wear security um um shirts, but they're not armed individuals. So their goal is, I believe, is to maybe just try to retrieve the stolen items from the individual without um getting into a situation with them, but um that's kind of dangerous. Um, I just tell them to just give us a call um, when it comes down to it. Um, we'll respond as we always do. Um, but taking, trying to take property back from individuals trying to steal it, um, that could be really dangerous and it's not safe. Uh, any other questions for Lieutenant Garvin? So I, I've, uh, I don't know if this is in your precinct, but. <laughs> At least on Twitter, it appears that there's been quite a spate of CVS and 7-Eleven robberies, burglaries, you know, grab and grab and run um, type of situations. And and it sounds like like for CVS, people are just stealing laundry detergent most of the time. Is that right? So that is happening in that district, but not in my in this 202 yeah. CVS area. But what I will tell you is um, we are putting a lot of effort um, into this situation. Um, these individuals, um, they are riding around. They're switching our cars, but they use, they're mostly still Kia's, Kia Soul. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, Montgomery County reached out to us today and said they had just stolen a vehicle and they were actually headed in D.C., but we never saw the vehicle. Um, so that is true. They're going around maybe four or five individuals running in grabbing laundry detergent and, and other items they're jumping the vehicles and they're leaving um so that's actually really high on our list right now um we're having operations pretty much every single day this week um at the cvs's to, in, ho in hopes that we'll actually catch them in the act and hopefully uh, when we make the arrests um they will be held accountable mm -hmm. and I is can't. it the same Oh yeah, why why the Kia? I assume they're hot wearing it, but also is it the same group of teenagers going around all these CBSs? We believe that it's the same group. Um looking at video surveillance and um pictures, it believes to be it's we believe it's the same group of individuals, it's maybe four to five um doing this, committing these acts. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I wonder if CBS will just stop putting laundry detergent on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> CBS is there. They're losing a a lot of money. A, a, I mean, an enormous amount of money. Um, so they're they're very invested, highly invested in helping, assisting us, uh, whatever whatever we need to assist with trying to um, identify these individuals and hopefully make an arrest. Yeah, two questions, uh, officer. Uh, when arrests are made, is the uh, dis is it the um, District attorney, are they pressing charges and putting them behind, putting them, putting these individuals in jail? And also traffic cameras. Can you use the traffic cameras to trace the, the location of the vehicles and where they go and catch catch up with these folks? Um, when we do make arrests um, for various reasons, sometimes these um, individuals are held accountable and sometimes they're not. It's different reasons. Um, too many to, to explain. And as far as traffic cameras, um, we we have LPR vehicles out, license plate reader vehicles um, that we um, put out in certain intersections um, where we just try to get the tags. And that's how we kind of communicate with um, other districts and saying, hey, last time we saw this vehicle, this stolen Kia, I'm sorry, um, this, this, this stolen vehicle was um, 18, 14 hours, it was headed down northbound on M Street or something like that. Yeah. So that's how we kind of communicate. A lot of times um, they will change to check the tags of the vehicles, these stolen cars to kind of throw us off. But any kids that we're seeing mostly that fits those descriptions, we're just running them in, in hopes that we can make contact to at least um, commit a stop on these individuals to identify them and go from there. Thank you so much. Um, and we do totally appreciate your efforts um, in helping to make our community safer, for sure. Thank you. Um, anything that we, and this is uh, Captain Roth is on as well, 
um, anything that we as community members can do um, to help uh, with your very difficult work um, in trying to mitigate uh, crime in the neighborhoods? Just be vigilant. Um, if you see something, say something. Please don't do not try to engage individuals. Um, I believe on yesterday, um, there were a couple of teenagers who believed to me maybe even smoking uh, marijuana or some illegal substance. And um, an individual who worked at Target made contact with these individuals and they assaulted him. Mm -hmm. um, so I, again, I would say just call us, give a description as detailed as possible. Let us know um, what's happening where it is but do not try to make contact um with these individuals please don't i mean it's, it's not safe to do that got it thank you very much but, oh so just one last question so with these individuals you're saying that if if you see a group of kids smoking up smoking marijuana that we can call you for that no what i mean is if if there's a situation i i would not try to admonish um anyone you believe to be have breaking a law or getting ready to commit a crime. What I'm saying is if you see something that looks to be a crime, just call us and give us as much information as possible. Um, don't go up to the citizen and say, you should not be doing this, you know, things of that nature. That's, that's what I'm referring to. That's not safe, sir. All right. Um, Captain Roth for MPG one. Hey, how are you, commissioners? Very well. How are you doing? Pretty good. Um, I won't take up too much of your time. Um, just to run through the stats real quick. Uh, we've had um, no robberies in Chinatown area. Um, we did have two in the Mount Vernon area. Um, and we had two ADWs on H Street. The one, I believe, is the shooting we talked about last time. There's the new one. This uh, young lady was stopped over in the 5th District. She had some lacerations. Um, she claimed that it occurred uh, on H Street in the 600 block uh, near Gallery Place. We really don't have a whole lot of information on that. Generally, we get uh, some pretty good footage from that area to see if this actually occurred there. But um, we are carrying that uh, on H Street until we can prove otherwise. Um, but those are really the only things. So the only um, in the last, you know, 30 days, there's been the uh, just those two ADWs. Um, the last 30 to 60 days, our, our crime is looking, you know, as good as crime can, I guess. Um, our burglaries are down by 50 percent. Uh, our motor vehicles uh, thefts are down by 75 percent. Our theft from autos are down by 9 percent and our thefts have evened off. Um, and then it's just a flat zero percent. So overall, our, our property crime is down um, by 16 percent. And we have an overall nine percent reduction um, in both property and violent. So we're heading in the right direction, uh, which is good, especially since, you know, summer's right around the corner. Um, but uh, I, I did want to highlight some of the some of our efforts up there. So. Uh, us, along with Metro Transit and U.S. Park Police, have really been kind of hitting that area up there pretty hard, especially around the Pat Handy Shelter, um, seven, eight hundred blocks of H, seventh, uh, in between H and I, the alleyways. Uh, and we pulled a number of guns out of there, actually. Uh, I think in the last couple of weeks, we've made upwards of 10 arrests for um, weapons violations and narcotics. Um, so we are making um, some significant cases up there. Uh, there has been more of an emphasis put on uh, the area by, uh, I believe, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the OAG to kind of help us get some of those cases papered. Um, so they are doing some pretty good, uh, pretty good work up there. But again, you know, I always say MPD can't do this alone. Right. And if we could, then we would probably be living in a utopia because our, our arrests are up 82 percent. Uh, our narcotics arrests are up 333% uh, since last year. So um, clearly this isn't an issue that we're going to be able to arrest our way out of. And we're going to have to get some uh, some help from uh, the other agencies. Um, 
The Pat Handy Shelter, I checked with DHS yesterday. It was supposed to close April 15th. I guess they were waiting on a certificate of occupancy or something. There may be somebody on the line that can uh, speak to this. But uh, regardless, they said that it's still on schedule to close by the end of this month. So hopefully that'll bring some much needed relief to the area, um, especially when it comes to our property crime uh, and our thefts. Um, and what I will say is we did have those two ADWs, but most of the crimes in the area um, generally are committed by um, either one of the unhoused individual or this criminal element that has attached itself to the unhoused up there. Um, and generally they are the offender and the victim of those crimes. So um you know, I I did have a couple of stabbings um, down by the shelter at Second and D, and again, same kind of same mo down there. You know, the the homeless uh, or unhoused tend to um, either be victims or victimized by other unhoused individuals. Um, you asked what you guys could do, you know, um, to help us out. I would take advantage of the camera rebate program. Um, you know, that's something offered through the district. And I, I don't know if you guys are familiar. I'm sure we've talked about it before where, you know, the city will reimburse you to put cameras on um, your home. And then uh, text 50411, like Lieutenant Garvin said, you may not want to, you, if you don't feel comfortable um, engaging these individuals, uh, totally understandable. But um, if you believe that they may be engaged in some sort of activity that might be unlawful. Now, obviously, if there's a crime of violence taking place, I want you to call 911. But if you happen to see somebody checking door handles, looking in windows, smoking marijuana, huddled up on a group uh, on steps that they're not supposed to be, if it's private property, whatever, you can text 50411. And that will go to um, our CIC and get dispatched. Um, I think you said there's somebody from OUC on here. They may be able to um, to provide a little bit more information on that. But uh, generally, those th those get routed to us. It's anonymous. And uh, we'll send a car over as soon as we can to take a look at what's going on over there. Um, just, you know, the other thing is I I've been trying to pop my head into some of the businesses up there and make security recommendations. Um, and, you know, I think I maybe addressed this on the last call. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I can only make the recommendation. A lot of them don't want to um, kind of, I guess, take those recommendations and, and do anything with them. So uh, as far as gallery place is concerned, um, you know, we did get the, uh, the office of the attorney general involved. Uh, I did a walk around gallery place the other day with them, showed them, you know, like, hey, if we increase lighting here, put some fencing here, make some environmental changes here, I think that it'll have a, a, a very positive impact on the uh, the environment up there. So um, I'm hoping with all of those, if we can get those changes done, the shelter closes, um, you know, and our continue enforcement efforts, I'm hope hopeful that here in the next few months that we start to see some real positive changes. And like I said, the numbers are generally trending in that direction. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, and I'll take any questions if anyone has anything. Um, I have a question about car carjacking. So you said that they're down in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. Do you think citywide, like, like there, it could have just been that there was this sort of wave of, popularity and now that's ebbing like does that happen like it, it's no, a lot of young people think oh i'm gonna try this and then now they're thinking oh it's not a good deal so we might be past the peak so what i will say is that um we've made here in the first district yeah. uh, we've made some pretty significant arrests when it comes to carjackings and robberies um there was one where Fortunately for us here in Bundy, we were untouched when it came. Right. every other district in the city got hit by um, um, either carjackings or robberies. Um, we didn't get hit until the very last one that they did uh, at the at the Walmart that was closed down. They jumped out, ran down the ramp, um, and pulled a security guard out of their car. Um, either way, we were able to stop an individual. We recovered a firearm. 
and then uh up in the fourth district they ended up arresting the other uh three individuals so we closed that case which closed almost 20 cases and then wow. there was another one uh you had mentioned um a, a spate of 7-eleven robberies yeah so we got hit with one of those over on h street and northeast um but again, they were all over the city, the same individual. And, I, and again, they arrested him um, over in the seventh district. And I believe they closed again, upwards of like 29 cases. And then uh, we had one individual that really beat us up in the beginning of the year. Not so much um, in the northwest side, kind of along uh, the Navy Yard, northeast side um, with a bunch of carjackings and robberies. We've arrested that individual. And I believe we closed almost, you know, 15, 16 cases with that. So I think that, yes, I think that it is um, kind of a game to some of the juveniles, um, some of the more seasoned offenders, I'll say, um, that are re repeatedly committing carjackings or robberies. Um, I'd say that we arrested some of them. And then, you know, you see like you arrest one and then you close a whole bunch of cases. Same with kind of like burglaries. Um, you know, you, you generally arrest one person, you end up closing, you know, 10, 15, 20 cases. So um i'm just hopeful that they get held uh and until trial and that they, they aren't released into the community so they can offend again um but i hope that answers your question thank yep. you thank you um there was um there was uh, i guess a an assault by of a a, a female uh on the 400 block of h street about a week ago Oh, is that the one that was that you were referring to that was. No, I believe that that, um, you know, what I, I promised somebody an update in that case, and I just looked at it the other day, but there's been a lot going on. So I, I, I don't remember if we made a, a, an arrest in that case or if we've identified a suspect. Um, I would have to look back into it. I know the one you're talking about. I believe it was unprovoked. Lady was just walking down the street and an individual um, punched her and she lost consciousness. Yeah. um so yes yeah that case was um god i gotta apologize i literally just looked at that the other day um i don't i, I don't quote me I, I don't think we closed that one but i think we did have some good leads or something i can't yeah i'm i'd have to look at it again thank you um and i know that i have gotten some um concerns over the last 24, 48 hours uh, from the uh, businesses right at uh, 5th and H, no, sorry, 6th and H, like the Chinatown Market, the Shore Tea, Share Tea mm -hmm. uh, location, um, having uh, groups of people, you know, stealing beverages, tip jars, supplies. So again, what, I, what I'll say to that is, I can only make the security yeah. recommendations. I, you know, move your products away from the front door so they can't yep. just be snatched. And for whatever reason, they don't want to, they don't seem yeah. super okay. inclined to make those, you know, to take those recommendations under advisement. So, I mean, we'll just go continue to go up there and take theft reports yeah. um, until they decide to make a change, you know, yeah. the, 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 We've recommended that they move the product away from the doors, put this, the cash register up front, not in the back of the place, stop them before they even come into the, you know, have them tell you what you want and then just hand it to them so they can pay and not even come into the store. However that looks, however, you know, mm -hmm. but they just, you know, so I, you know, I, it's frustrating for me because I've been up there, I've spoken to them and I've said like, Hey, these are the things that we, you know, that I would implement if I were you to try to prevent some of this stuff. And they said that they're just going to sign a petition to have the Chinatown unit come back. <laughs> okay, gotcha. There is, gotcha. There is no Chinatown unit coming. So, you know. <laughs> yep, there it is. Okay. All right. So thank you. Uh, uh, we have one hand up. We have um, Howard Marks. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman Schenkel. And thank you, uh, uh, Captain Roth, for your service. Um, you might be pleased to know that we've already implementing or are implementing one of your recommendations regarding security in front of the residence at Gallery Place, and that is we're getting enhanced lighting okay. in our alcove. 
which was your recommendation. And we're in the process of getting uh, bids from contractors to do that because we totally agree with you on that one. Uh, the other thing is uh, I would like to invite you at some mutually convenient time to talk to our community on Zoom. Um, you know, we have these uh, drug dealers, or I don't know how you describe them exactly, um, all involved with cannabis and involved with marijuana, weed, whatever you want to call it. And they block the path, even, even our alcove. Just the other day, my wife and I tried to leave and they weren't threatening or anything, but they sort of like took it over like it was their private property. And I'm very concerned there will be an incident eventually. You know, you see these people uh, involving in illegal activity and they sort of like, you know, get out of my way. Uh, they're threatening. And I think we need guidance from the MPD about how to react to that because they're not going away any anytime soon. Um, and so maybe uh, I'll send you an email and, and maybe we could set something up. Is that is that all right with you or? Yeah, that's fine. I, I've been. So what I've been doing is I've been meeting with. Um, Ebony from the downtown bid, we've been going around to uh, a bunch of different um, businesses and stuff like that. And she gives a presentation. I kind of give a presentation. So, I mean, we can do something like that as well. I'm trying to get that entire area lit up like Times Square, to be honest with you, because I think the less cracks and crevices they have to hide in, I think that that'll be um, a, a pretty significant um, improvement. I put in myself. Me and one of my lieutenants went up there and we put in like over 90 311 requests to have the lights changed. Um, if we found like an out uh, light, we, we put in a 311 request. I just think that those lights that they have up there, although they are nice and they're very ornamental and decorative, they don't put off a lot of light. Um, and so if we could get Capital One and the gallery place side to increase the lighting um, significantly, I think all the way around, I think that I have a positive impact on 7th and 6th and F and H. So that that's what my hope is. Um, and like I said, when we did the walkthrough with OAG, um, they seem to seem to think the same. So hopefully, um, you know, that, that, that happens relatively soon, but shoot me an email and we'll set something up. And sure. And if offline, if you give me the name of the assistant U S attorney you're dealing with, because clearly this is great frustration for us here that you guys uh, go out of your way to try to enforce these laws and the uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, as we know, historically has been resistant. And we, you know, that's a breakthrough in, in my opinion that you got someone from the U.S. Attorney's Office to accompany you, Captain Roth, that's that's really a huge development. And one well, it's that <laughs> well, it's OAG, it's not you. Well, actually I'll take that back. USAO is, um, they are interested in our stats too. So I had one of my lieutenants pull all of our stats. So. We're sending all that stuff to them. Hopefully, um, you know, I, I, I'm positive that we've made enough noise that this has now become a priority. So that's 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 my hope, and then I'm ho I'm hoping that um, you know, they're you know we're not just out here locking up the same people over and over and over again for the same for the same thing. So I'm hoping that um, you know, once we make these arrests. They at least, you know, if they can, even if it's a misdemeanor, if they can take them out of the community for three months, that, that would, that would, that would help. You know what I mean? So right. I'm not saying lock everybody up that's drinking a beer or smoking a blunt on the corner. That's not really going to solve all our problems, but you know, in the short term, it might, you know. Sure. One final question. And I don't want to take up uh, too much to the meeting, uh, which I've done already, but um, this is about a week ago. There was an incident in front of the HSBC bank. Uh, at night, there was at least five to seven police cars, MPD cars. Uh, there must have been 15 uh, officers. Mm -hmm. They surrounded. I saw that the arrest was in progress. I could see it out of my condo window over there. Uh, what what happened that night? So I think that that was one of those weapon recoveries that I was talking about. So I think um, there, there. I mean, there have been quite a few up there recently. We've been we've been really trying to hammer that area. Um, Someone uh, pointed out to one of our sergeants that an individual was armed and um, he called it out. And then when the officers responded up there, they were able to take him into custody without incident, and recover that firearm off of him. So um, you, you might see some more of that. Um, like I said, we're really trying to crack down up there um, and pull them out of your community. So 
A lot of them don't live there either. You know, the guy that got shot up there, like I said, like I mentioned on the last meeting, I talked to him. I said, hey, man, you know, stop hanging out up here. Take these. He lives in Maryland. I said, you know, take these guys out to Maryland with you. And he said, <laughs> no, do that. so, um, you know, so, I mean, we're doing everything we can as far as MPD is concerned. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're contacting these folks. I spent more time in the alley behind the shelter than I'd like to admit. Um, so, you know, we, we are out there. Um, but the only thing I can, I, I show up with handcuffs and some recommendations. That's, that's about the extent of what I can do. Thank you, okay. Captain Thank you, Captain. All right. No problem. Greatly appreciate Captain, it. I've, I've got continue. one question. Um, the stoops along H Street in Chinatown, mm -hmm. is that considered private property? And if, if people are sitting on the stoops and, um, and blocking entrance to businesses, uh, is that something that the yeah. Are so that that is enforceable. And even if I think the argue, argument can be made, even if it wasn't private property, you're still blocking passage to a business, which is an offense. Right. It falls underneath some disorderly statute. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's private property. Um, I would. You know, and again, I don't I don't want to keep saying this, but I've made the recommendation bar these individuals that gives us the power to arrest them. If you bar them. And you can produce a barring notice. When we show up on scene, we will place them under arrest if they refuse to leave. Generally, we try to get compliance, right? And generally, they will comply. But at the end of the day, if there's just someone who is not willing to move or we've been there multiple times and we've given them warnings um, and they keep coming back, then yes, we can place them under arrest. So if they're sitting on the steps and it's a private home, private uh, business, whatever, and they have a barring notice in place, you know, MPD doesn't issue barring notices. We just facilitate um, the issuance so we can come up there and maintain the peace, bar that individual. It'll be on our body cameras. That way, you know, when we lock them up the next time, we'll go to court and say, hey, this person was warned on this day not to be here. They were barred, blah, blah, blah. We locked them up here and hopefully they paper that case later. But yes, to answer your question, um, those are both offenses. Hanging out up there uh, against the lawful owner or person in control of that building um, and um, blocking passage uh, are, are both offenses. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. We appreciate your efforts and um, look forward to see continued resolution um, in Chinatown. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't believe we have, as I said, um, I don't believe we have anybody from the mayor's office this evening. Um, if we do, uh, let me know. Um, but we will move forward to the office of Ward 2 Council Member Brooke Pinto. I saw that we had Pablo on. Pablo? Are yes. You there? there you are. Okay, there you are. Good to see everyone. How's everybody doing? Very well, thank you. Good, good. So I'll just um, go ahead and jump into my updates then. Uh, so we're quickly moving through budget season and final negotiations are underway and the first budget vote will be on May 16th with the final vote taking place in early June. Uh, as you all know, Council Member Pinto chairs the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety and the committee released their 136 page draft budget a few weeks ago. Uh, but just to give some highlights from that 136 page document that I imagine all of you have read in full, uh, the council member sees this budget as a blueprint for making DC safer and for making you safer. That remains her top priority as council member. We're funding new safe commercial corridor grants to help keep our main street safer and funding violence interruption and community-based crime prevention programs that have proven results all around the city as well as in other locations around the country. There's also a new pilot program for enhanced security and custodial services at schools that also function as public play playgrounds and fields. So through that, we wanna make sure that people have access to all of these public spaces, but also that the schools have the security that they need to uh, allow the public to continue using those spaces safely. Uh, there's also going to be support for the Department of Forensic Science to ensure accurate and timely evidence analysis. 
The budget promotes data collection and sharing by allowing the Office of the Attorney General to hire data analysts and will strengthen OAG's ability to penalize illegal dumping suspects. Finally, it restores funding for victim services and legal aid. And while we're talking public safety, I will say that the council member is, of course, sad to see MPD Chief Conti departing, but looks forward to working to confirm a new chief who is ready to take on the very serious public safety challenges that we're facing. In other budget wins that are of special note for 2C, I wanted to mention that we were able to establish funding for a Chinatown clean team, as well as maintaining funding for DPW sweep inspectors. Uh, there will be renovation of all playgrounds at Thompson Elementary, uh, Farragut Park extension and activation. We were also able to include a requirement that DDOT add an option for repairs to porous flexible pavement on 311, which is currently missing. So if you've seen those sidewalks that have uh, that kind of porous, flexible pavement material, you'll now be able to submit 311 requests to uh, make any repairs to those. If you see that they're kind of like cr crumbling apart a little bit, as happens uh, occasionally, it'll be a lot easier to alert DDOT to uh, those repairs. The council member is also working to add funding to the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which is going to be seriously strained this next fiscal year. And lastly, I wanted to add that the council member is calling for returning funding to the K Street Transit Way project and eliminating the proposed surcharge on rideshare trips in and out of downtown. Uh, she feels that both of these pro proposals would disincentivize people from living, visiting, and working in downtown, precisely as we're trying to do the opposite. Now, as we get ready for the summer, Council Member Pinto also sent a letter to the Construction Codes Coordinating Board of the Department of Buildings, asking them to reevaluate the time frame that residential buildings with central air are required to turn the air conditioning on. So currently, buildings are required to have it on from May 15th to September 15th, which means that many residents in D.C. are still without air conditioning and will be without air conditioning for at least six more days. And this was last updated in 2017 that we know of, and climate change has only made this issue more pronounced in recent years. Uh, Councilmember Henderson also introduced legislation that Councilmember Pinto is co-sponsoring to change the dates from April 15th to October 31st. During hearings for the bill, they'll need to discuss how this will work in buildings that cannot switch easily. Uh, some buildings have older systems that can take up to two weeks to fully switch from heating to cooling or vice versa. So it's something that, uh, which is also why we just recommended to the Construction Code Coordinating Board that they revise this time frame and make sure that they continue revising it as uh, the climate continues to change and as temperatures continue to change. Uh, we just want to make sure that this time frame stays as up to date as possible with the uh, temperatures and weather that people are actually experiencing. Next month, the council member will be marching in the Capitol Pride Parade, which is on Saturday, June 10th. Uh, so if you'd like to march with our office, we'd be happy to have you, and I'll post a sign-up link in the chat. Uh, so thank you, and I'll go ahead and post all the uh, links I have in the chat, and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Pablo. We appreciate you and your update. I know that um, when you're talking about the the side walks. Can you tell me a little bit more about like what the forest kind of sidewalk area? What does that tell me about that? Yeah, so typically most of the sidewalks are just regular cement or pavement or, you know, I don't know the minutia of all that. Maybe uh, someone from DDOT would be able to go into the specifics a bit more. But if you've seen the, uh, it's kind of like a darker black pavement. Oh, like black A lot of times kind of starts to crumble apart a little bit if oh, it's been yeah. there for a while. Uh, occasionally they'll just use it as a temporary fix and then we'll repave over it with a uh, regular pavement as well. But I know in other places they've been using it just because the porous nature of it, which allows water to filter through can be, uh, better for the environment or if it's near a tree box, things of that nature, uh, just better for drainage in general. So I know that's why they prefer to use it. I believe it may also just be, uh, more inexpensive as well but it does require some more regular maintenance since it, as, at least in our experience in the past few years, seems to come apart a little bit quicker. So that's why we made sure that that could be added to 311 so residents could notify DDOT specifically that PFP sections of sidewalk or 
are the ones that need some uh, maintenance. Got it. Got it. I think that D dot. Um, uh, I'm assuming D dot is the 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 agency that maintains this, but um, I will say that to get a sidewalk repaired is insane. Um, really long process and they put this, you know, black top or whatever we call it in there and they consider that to be done. It seems like uh, it's, it's, it's been almost two years since someone put their foot through the, um, the concrete vault cover at Metro Center, where as you exit the, the, the Metro station, and there is still a one of those big pieces of metal over top of it, which is a terrible tripping hazard um, in, in that area. So um, they they definitely need to to work on their their processes for improvement of of sidewalks. No, um, absolutely, and we've uh, we've made sure to share that with DDOT as well for the past couple of years, and. Um, we're we're always thinking about what we can do to help DDOT be uh, quicker to make those repairs. Yeah, stop with all the flex posts and get some sidewalks done, right? <laughs> uh, other yeah. commissioners, do you have any questions for Pablo? Uh, yeah, unless unless other other commissioners have questions, um, yeah, Thomas. Uh, pa Pablo, uh, there are there are some like large metal plates that are lying around on sidewalks at different intersections downtown. I, I see them all the time when I'm taking my daughters to school. Um, these are like, you know, um, eight feet by four feet large, one inch plates. I can give you the specific intersections. Do you know what those are for? And can we remove them? They seem to be like forgotten from some roadway project. Typically when we reach out about those, um, it is as part of some ongoing maintenance or infrastructure project. But if you see any that you know for a fact have been there for a really long time, which I'm sure you have, definitely feel free to share that with uh, with our office or with a DDOT representative. And we can try to figure out who exactly installed those and see if there is any ongoing work or reason for, for those to be there or if, mm -hmm. uh, Maybe some work needs to be done to get those removed and get a sidewalk repaved. All right. And then also, is uh, is our commissioner proposing any cuts at all um, to help balance our current budget? I know she's requested some increases, but are there any cuts as well that she's recommending? Um, I'm not sure of any specific cuts that she's called for. Um, I know in budget season, a lot of time within the specific committees, council members will look to see how they can move money around potentially, but uh, primarily the council member is looking to uh, help fund projects that are important to Ward 2, and I'm not sure of any specific areas that she's been asking for cuts in. Thank you. Um, and uh, commissioners, any other questions you have? Um, and we have Howard uh, Marks with his hands up. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Schenkel. Two very quick questions for uh, Brooke Pinto's representatives. The first is this the release of money for this clean team in, uh, in Chinatown. Uh, I thought that Red Hats uh, from the downtown bid are the ones out there cleaning. I'm a little confused about where the who exactly is getting this money. Thank you. That's a great question. I'm not sure exactly... I know Downtown Bid does do a great job of getting their cleaners out there. I think this would be additional to that. Um, I'm not exactly sure I'd have to double check which organization specifically the money's going to. I know typically it goes to Main Street's organization. So Shaw Main Street's, for example, has a clean team. And uh, we just wanted to make sure that that was expanded to Chinatown since we've heard from a lot of residents that they wanted to see some more cleaning around there. It may just be going to the downtown bid to help expand their cleaning operations. I'd have to double check though. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, secondly, I wanted to commend uh, council member Pinto for uh, uh, opposing this uh, uh, ill-conceived Ill uh, surcharge, $2 surcharge on shared ride services into the downtown area. 
This is just, to, to me, part of the war on downtown, whether it's decriminalization of marijuana, decriminalization of metro fare evasion, flooding downtown with e-scooters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and I, 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 I have a question or a point I would make to the ANC and Commissioner Schenkel if the um, if, if if the ANC would consider sending a letter of support to uh, Council Member Pinto in opposing the uh, this surcharge, which singles out people yes. that live downtown. Thank you. Definitely. Um, when is when is that um, up for a vote, Pablo? Uh, that's a great question. I'm not sure when the first vote would be on that, but I know they're trying to work everything through sort of in conjunction with uh, the budget. So I imagine they'd be trying to get that through fairly quickly since I know primarily they were looking to have this as a additional revenue source for the fare free bus program, which also looks like uh, may not go through now. So uh, we'll be interesting to see where uh, we go from here on the ride share fees and on everything related to that now moving forward. Um, do you know who introduced that? that... Uh, Council Member Nadeau. Yeah, of course. Terrific. Awesome. <laughs> um, um, can I ask a quick question? Please. Mm -hmm. Is there someone to whom we should send an email or if any of the community members before a budget vote next Tuesday um, to say that we are against that ride share? I mean, I live in downtown and I don't have a car, so that would definitely mm -hmm. impact me personally. But um, is there a, a way in which we can make our voices heard prior to Absolutely. it being voted I think, I think best uh, members to reach out to are the at-large council members and the chairman, uh, especially mm -hmm. since you, know, you all live in Ward 2 and we're in agreement on this issue. We're gonna continue advocating for that. But mm -hmm. to uh, kind of spread that opinion as far as you can, I would suggest the at-large council members. Thanks, Pablo. Appreciate that. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Pablo, that, uh, that extra fee, is that for people picking up from downtown or coming to downtown or both? Both. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your update. Um, with that comment, um, I would like to move that we send a letter of support for not having the fee or a letter of protest for having the fee. I'm a a letter of concern? A uh, concern, right, right. A, a letter <laughs> of objection. Concern. A letter of objection. A letter of objection. Thank you. Yeah. A letter of objection for a, a rephrase. Um, I like to form, I like to move that we send a letter uh, of rejection for the potential uh, surcharges for accessing downtown BC. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Seconded. Oh. Seconded Thank by you. Kristen. All those in favor? Four of four commissioners voting in favor of that. So we will have to move quickly on that to get that out. Okay, um, well, does, that, does that fee apply to taxis as well or is just Uber and Ubers and Lyfts? That's a good question. That's something I was wondering myself. It's, it's and, only the apps. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. All right. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you. Um, is there anybody, I'm sorry, I, I missed up my agenda. I missed uh, the Office of Unified Communications. Do we have any representatives from Unified Communications along with us? I didn't see um, Ingrid on this evening. Okay. Uh, we will move forward. All right, let's go to local events that impact the community. We have a DC Smart S Smart Street Lighting Project. Um, and we have uh, Patrice Brooks. And Hi, good uh, afternoon. Good evening. Hi. Thank you so much for letting me join you all, yes. Most definitely, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> I have a presentation I'm going to pull up, and I also have uh, my colleague, Anna, that's also on the line as well to answer questions. If you just give me one moment, I'll pull it up. Thank you. Thank 
And you see my screen okay? Yes. All righty. So again, um, commissioners, I'm here on behalf of the DC Smart Street Lighting Project. Um, and I wanna say thank you so much this evening for letting our team provide an update to you all on this great project that will be helping to make a brighter, better connected DC. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just go ahead and go start with the presentation. Uh, this project will bring several community benefits um, to the community. Um, they'll be modernizing over 72,000 street lights as well as converting street lights to LED technology um, and eliminating 38,000 tons of green gas emissions each year. Um, this project will also be adding over 200 wireless access points um, in several of the wards in the district. Mm. Yes. As you can see here on your screen, um, the project timeline. So some of the work has already started. Uh, you really, our team has um, started some of that rehabilitation work as well, um, where there's boots on the ground completing the work um, and starting to get that work done. Um, Q2 of 2023, you'll see that there'll be some conversion work that will also be starting and um, asset management work will, has already started and will be underway until 2037. Within the design and construction phase, that is where um, the work will be getting to be will be getting done uh, specifically in your word ward. You'll be able to see um, that work getting started. Some of that those tasks include um, design, procurement, and mobilization, um, and the rehab work, which is um, making upgrades to the foundation and the poles and the arms of those street lights. The conversion work, which includes the light installation, will occur um, per group of wards and split per ANC. So each ANC is split into several bundles with less than five bundles per ANC. Um, all of this work will be um, taking place within a bundle, shouldn't last more than 14 days. So when you're saying it's a bundle, I'm sorry. So we will, you will do like an area you'll focus on an area for like 14 days? Yes, so okay. if you look on the map here, there's group one, they had consists of five, seven, and eight, group two, which is wards four, three, and two, and then group three, which is one and six. Got it. Wards one is, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, the asset management phase, um, as you heard me mention before, um, just to kind of clarify what that means is street light maintenance. A preliminary asset preliminary asset management services begin in fall 2022, and full asset management services will begin in Q2 of 2023 when um, as the lights are becoming available. Um, by May 2024, all LEDs are set to be installed, and asset management will continue, which is street light maintenance will continue until 2037. Mm -hmm. The timeline is just being shown here again. So, so I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Are you prefer do you want me to wait to the end? Um, if you don't mind waiting to the sure. end, because my Please. colleague may be able to answer it a little bit better. Sure. That'll be great. Thank you. So a part of this project is um, keeping the public as well as the ANCs informed um, um, about the process every step of the way. Uh, we do have a very robust um, outreach and engagement notification process. So uh, one of the things that, some of the things that we are doing is um, before the work starts, at least 45 days prior, we are following up and notifying the impact of ANCs Seven days prior to the start of work, our grassroots team will be leaving door hangers for residents and businesses to let them know about the upcoming work and then also making notice of any emergency no parking that will um, be put into place if that is affected. Um, 72 hours prior to the start of work, emergency no parking signs will be hung up um, if they're needed and the, so the community is aware. 
Um, so if you do have any questions after this presentation or you would like to stay abreast um, and follow the project, please um, feel free to scan this QR code on the screen. It'll take you directly to the website. You can review the project FAQs. Um, and you can also visit the um, project website by visiting streetlights.dc.gov. And that's S-T-R-E-E-T-L-I-G-H-T-S dot dc dot gov for anyone that's on the phone. I can also put this information in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do understand that some of the commissioners do have questions. If you have some questions at this time, we'll be more than happy to answer them. My colleague Anna is on the line and she will be able to address them. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, I have uh, a couple of questions. Um, so you mentioned two dates, March 2024 and May 2037. Is are are we it is will this be completed by May? I, I'm, I'm May 2024, or it's going to be throughout. It's going to be a slow progress. I can take that. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ana Hasegawa, and I am with the design and construction contractor, which will be responsible or is responsible for the project through May 2024. So the way the DDOT structured this project is there are two companies, Angie and Equans. So Angie is responsible for the scope of work that ends in 2024. And that is conversion of the 75,000 lights uh, with controls. So those are dimmable. Uh, you can dim them remotely. Uh, restoration uh, slash replacement of, of poles that are in poor quality, well, poor state. Uh, T bases, foundations, arms. So everything that was uh, deemed by the D by the DDOT as being in poor condition will be replaced by May 2024. After May 2024, Equans um, will continue their work just providing the regular maintenance to the street lights that you typically see. So if there are lights are out or accidents, pole knocked out, uh, you call the 311 number and report and they will continue uh, maintaining the, the street light network. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, that, that's very, very helpful. That's a, that's a lot of changes to make in such a short period of time. So one good yes. luck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we understand that we have spent the previous uh, two to three years planning. Got so it. obviously there are hiccups and there are things that are unplanned, but uh, we have we do have a good foundation to implement this project, and you know, hopefully we won't disturb the community too much. Uh, for the lighting conversion, it is a rolling operation, uh, meaning we shouldn't spend more than 25 minutes at each Cobra head light um, and 45 minutes to convert each uh, post tops and teardrop lights. I'm not sure if you guys, you guys probably know the difference in between, between those, right? The Cobra heads are the more like highway type, the simple type and the teardrops and post tops are the more architectural uh, type of lighting. Um, so 45 minutes for the ones that are, like look a little fancier and uh, about 25 minutes or less for the, the Cobra head ones. So it shouldn't cause too much disturbance within the community. Um, now, when we have to replace a foundation, for example, uh, then we'll go through that procedure that Patrice had on the screen where we, you know, uh, do door hangers and no parking signs and, and uh, we meet all the requirements uh, imposed by the DDOT. Got it. Great. And I know that downtown, our 
our poles, we have both the cobra head poles and the what I would call more decorative, which I guess is mm-hmm. your chair. You're not we're maintaining those posts, right? Right. So everything um, as far as the, the poles and, and the arms, uh, everything is being replaced in kind. So Got as it. far as the visuals, uh, you know, if there's anything with historical integrity, that will all be maintained. Got it. OK, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, commissioners, do you have other questions? Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah. Uh- down in Penn Quarter, where I reside, um, many of the decorative street lamps have a, a much softer glow. Um, they, they give off a, an orangey glow um, as opposed to a, a more harsh white light. Um, do you know, uh, will, that, will, will that softer orange glow be maintained or are you changing the color temperature of the LED light to a much higher a K light. So it will be a softer color. I cannot tell you exactly because I didn't participate in the design. I cannot tell you because I know they're very orange, right? I cannot right. guarantee you it will have the same orange, but it will have a softer yellow color. And that was all determined by the D dot. So they decided uh, all the color temperatures they wanted. Um, and I know they took uh, a lot into consideration like historical uh, integrity. Right. And uh, they were in discussions with, I'm gonna butcher this, the entity that is concerned about wildlife um, mm-hmm. preservation, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there were very mm-hmm. stringent requirements uh, in regards to the uplight as well. So uh, like, according to, to our designers and vendors, it was like pretty much the most stringent um, requirements we've seen, you know, within other cities. Um, and all that is, is, has value, obviously, uh, in terms of preser- preserving, you know, uh, nature. We're, we're all here concerned about giving pedestrians safety, but also uh, preserving the environment as well. Right. Because, you know, down where I guess where I reside, uh, even though we have the softer lighting, I mean, the streets are pretty well lit as it is. So I would, I would hate to come out one night and, and see a, very, a much harsher light that doesn't, you know, um, go with the, you know, the more historical setting uh, of, yeah. of this particular neighborhood. No, it definitely won't be a harsh white. Um, Patrice, mm-hmm. if you can um, make a note and make sure we post in the FAQs the tables, we can provide the, the tables uh, with the color temperature. Okay. Um, as far as safety, we did follow the ASHTO uh, for street lights. Um, mm-hmm. You know that determines the the minimum amount of lighting and uniformity mm-hmm. that needs to hit the ground for, um, mm-hmm. you know, road safety and pedestrian safety. Uh, mm-hmm. The the softness of the yellow or of the light. I know there were serious considerations taken into. So what I can do is we can post that in the, the FAQs and that way you can uh, determine, it, it, it's a simplified table, but you should be able to determine which one is the light that you have in your vicinity and, mm-hmm. uh, and the color temperature that's, that you're gonna be getting. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, community questions or concerns? Awesome. Um, and uh, you are um, bringing this to us for awareness at this point, just just checking to make sure that you're not needing any uh, support from us at this point. No, no I, sorry. No, I think it's, this is just a notification that this project will be at your neighborhood. Um, I believe according to the schedule, 
it will be towards the end of the project. So I would say December, January. Got it. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate this update and look forward to seeing all of our lights working and coordinated and talking to one another and everything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you mm -hmm. so much too. Appreciate it. Um, we have uh, next on our agenda is the uh, Golden Triangle Business Improvement District letter of support uh, for the District Commission on the Arts and Humanities for a grant to replace the in-kind and existing Fon Sham Rain Garden sculptures on 19th Street. Thank you, uh, Chairman Shankle, and good evening, everybody. Uh, we won't take much of your time either. My name is Andrew Huff. I'm the Associate Director of Member and Government Relations at the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District. Um, we are new to ANC 2C with the uh, recent ANC redistricting. So we've been working with um, and connected with Commissioner Strauss on a number of issues. So <clears throat> it's good to be with all of you tonight. Um, just uh, by point of information, the Golden Triangle boundaries are roughly uh, DuPont Circle to the north, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue to the south, 16th Street to the east, and 21st Street to the west. We are the second oldest and second largest bid after our neighboring uh, downtown bid. Uh, who we work with very closely on a number of issues. My colleague, uh, Helen Solomon is here tonight. She's with our planning department. Um, many of you may not know this, but the Golden Triangle was the first LEED certified bid in the country. We're a LEED platinum neighborhood. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the installation of several rain gardens that capture stormwater uh, running in the downtown. Um, we also have a fairly extensive public art program. Uh, and in this particular case, we've combined our public art program and our environmental program. Uh, and we've got some really uh, cool sculptures in our rain gardens. Um, Helen is gonna tell you a little bit, of mo little bit more about that. But as uh, Chairman Shankle stated, we're basically uh, here for a letter of support from the ANC to include as part of a grant application to the District's Commission on Arts and Humanities to, um, to replace the sculptures in kind. So with that, I'll hand it over to Helen real quick. Thanks again for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the intro. And thank you, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen sure. real quick. Just have a short presentation to share. Okay. Here we are. I think it's showing the notes, but there are no notes, so <laughs> that's all right. Um, all right, so thank you again for for having us and letting me give you a little presentation on our on our upcoming project. So, as Andrew said, we'll be um, submitting an application under the um, Public Art Building Communities Grant, um, and that's with the DC Commission uh, on the Arts and Humanities. Um, and so we're here to, you know, ask for approval and a letter of support um, as the application deadline is in July. So we're trying to get through um, all of the requirements and submit well before then. Um, oops, there we go. There we go. <laughs> so you may have seen some of these um, sculptures on 19th Street. Um, they go between K through L, um, or sorry, K through M, but the three that we'll be um, constructing with, with this grant uh, would all be along um, the 19th and L Street intersection. Um, so five of these sculptures that we currently had up, have up are made with more durable wood. Um, they were put up in 2020, um, assuming that they would be permanent fixtures. And so with this grant, we'll be using funds to design, construct, and um, implement three new durable sculptures using the same Braveheart or Greenheart wood. Um, and they would be under the same likeness as the existing sculptures we have, 
same materials, um, and using the same artist, Foon Sham. So a little background on the sculptures for those who may not be aware. Um, we believe this these project and these sculptures in general help continue to humanize the 19th Street block because it's a very um, busy block, especially between K and um, M where there are a lot of businesses um, and a lot of ground floor retail space. Um, but then at the same time, the sculptures also support our neighborhoods and the BIDS um, environmental sustainability initiatives. Um, so here's some pictures of existing sculptures we have up. Um, they're all constructed on existing sculpture paths, either adjacent to or in um, our rain gardens. And the purpose of the sculptures, besides being aesthetically beautiful and, and adding to the, to the block, they actually collect rainwater um, up top um, and then store the rainwater and filter it through into the um, adjacent rain gardens. Um, and the purpose of this is to reduce stormwater um, runoff and you know have have a stormwater management system that's also, you know, has a twofold effect where it also serves as public art. Mm -hmm. So again, um, with the PBAC funds, we'll hope to um, design, construct, and implement three completely new sculptures uh, on our existing sculpture pads. Um, and the point of um, refabricating these pieces, these three pieces, is so that we have um, more sustainability and durability along the block, um, because the three pieces that we have now are are not made with wood that will loss uh, that will last because they are rotting um, and chipping away. So, um, with the assumption that we do get the grant in July, we're hoping to begin um, fabricating and um, installing the work uh, late September of next year. And that is all. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take it. No, that's that's great. Yes, I have uh, seen the sculptures and been over there. So yeah, they are they are great. Um, any questions from the commissioners? Go, ahead, Thomas. What will become of the existing structures? Yeah, so there are eight in total. Um, five of them will remain. Um, because they were um, newly put up in 2020, and with the wood that they were uh, made out of, uh, they they can last 20 to 30 years. Um, the existing pieces will be taken down. Um, they're owned by uh, the artist Foon Sham, so I'm sure he will like, either recycle them and use them in his new works. Um, but yeah, then then we'll bring in three three new pieces but three new completely completely redesigned um, sculptures and put them in the same exact locations. Would you consider moving them elsewhere in the downtown neighborhood like my special member district or private residence? Yeah. <laughs> you know, he does do a lot of um, you know, private works. So, if you're interested in him, look up Foon Sham. He does some great work, but these three pieces in particular that we're removing, um, they are starting to rot. So I don't know if you'd want them in your anywhere else. <laughs> Good point. I was going to say, I heard the word rot. I think yeah. that. Uh, I don't know if you want them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But awesome. Awesome. He Any... provided um, Commissioner Strauss with a uh, draft letter of support. Um, oh, great. Basically, it was a, a similar letter that was provided by ANC 2B last year. So it's it's pretty straightforward. Awesome. Yeah. Commissioner Strauss, do you want to make a recommendation? Put forward a motion for a letter of support for the Golden Triangle bid. I will second that. All those in favor, say aye. Awesome. Four of four commissioners voting uh, in favor of that. And um, could we uh, 
move for Commissioner Strauss, uh, Strauss uh, to send that letter of support on our behalf and be the point person for this. Is there a second? Uh, there's a second. Sorry, yes, I'll second that. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button for a hot minute. And all those in favor? Four or four voting in favor of that. Okay, awesome. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. That out for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing this here. And we're happy to have uh, you in our, a little part of you in our ANC too. Absolutely. Yeah, we'd be happy to come back to talk about some other stuff we're doing along uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and some other initiatives as well. That would be great. We would love that. All right. Thanks, everybody. So much. Thank you. See you guys. Okay. Um, we'll move on to our ABRA licensing. And um, Takaria, is it Oshai? I'm so terrible with pronunciation. Go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, Commissioner. This is Manal Mahmoud with Malleus O'Brien Sandground. Uh, this is Takaria Sochi, and it's going to be one of the stalls in the new food hall um, down at International Square. Um, so the 1825 um, I Street, K Street, that entire block. And so um, this is um, just more authentic Mexican cuisine. Um, they focus on Puebla style sandwiches, as well as authentic tacos. And they will be one of, I believe, eight stalls that are gonna be opening up in the next couple of months. Awesome. I am so excited that we're just <laughs> um, Definitely. Um, and and this is this is this is like one big space, and they're they're kind of, it sounds like they're kind of like dividing it up to have like so much seating for the stall or what, tell me. Yeah, so not every stall will have its own seats, but there will be like a shared community of seats. Um, when you walk into the food hall, there's going to be a central bar and the bar will have seats. And then in between the bar and the different stalls, will be um, just um, seats for anyone to go to any stall and just sit kind of like um, in Union Market, for example. Right, right. Um, but they will have designate, 22 designated seats for their stall. Got it, got it. Um, and uh, there, I did have a, a question um, for folks, uh, just for everyone's awareness, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Um, ANC, uh, the Office of ANC um, advised that we are no longer uh, permitted to have open chats. Um, so all the chats have to be moderated uh, through the uh, commissioners. Uh, but, but we do have a question um, and that was, um, will will the food area be open on the weekends? Do you know? Yes, yes. So um, you know, this is definitely oh, going okay. to be a week weekday, weeknight, and weekend. Um, you know, um, food hall. So it's not just targeted for the business district at all. That's great. Awesome. Very excited about that. Um, I'd like to move that we send a letter of support. Thank you so much, Commissioner. This APRA license. Seconded. All those in favor? So I have three of four commissioners voting in favor of that. Okay. Awesome. So yes. uh, and you was that a yes? <laughs> yes. Oh, that doesn't look like a commissioner. Hold on. Four of four <laughs> commissioners voted in favor yes. of that. Awesome. Fantastic. So uh, we'll get a letter of support off to you. Do you need a stipulated license by chance? Uh, no, we don't. Thank you okay. so much, Commissioner. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael, uh, you said something interesting. You said something that we can't use chats anymore. Is that what you said uh, uh, in the Zoom meeting? Uh, the, uh, the Office of ANC sent an advisory out uh, that the chats must be a moderated chat that comes only to the commissioners 
um, because I guess there had been problems in other ANCs regarding this. So uh, the chat feature just goes uh, to the commissioners and I've been pushing it, pushing out comments or updates that people have had uh, throughout the evening. And I believe that, I believe I have uh, Kristen and I believe I activated for uh, Becky as well when they came in, um, but I missed you uh, when we I was activating at the beginning. But I'll make sure that you all have access to that next time. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we'll move on to planning, zoning, environment, and historic present pres <laughs> historic preservation. Um, the first up is 808th Street Northwest. Um, application for a special exemption relief. And I think I see Eric on in the middle. All yes. light is up. Okay. Thank Go you, for Commissioner. Um, my name is Eric DeBear, uh, Land Use Counsel from Cozen O'Connor, behalf of the applicant. I'm going to share my screen and then introduce uh, my client from Society of Science for the Public. Awesome. So bear with me here. And now I will turn it over to Caitlin Goldberg. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening. Um, I am with Society for Science. We are a nearly or just over 100 year old nonprofit organization um, that is delighted to be moving to 808th Street. Um, hopefully we're going to close this summer. Um, we are, as I said, a, a 501c3 membership organization. Uh, we were founded by EW Scripps as a wire service uh, to disseminate science articles and information to uh, newspapers. Uh, we've since taken on several award-winning, um, uh, the publications award-winning in our uh, programs, our science education programs that we do for middle and high school students are world renowned with the Regeneron Science Talent Search being one and the Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair being another. We also do quite a few number of equity um, and outreach programs, STEM programs for students both within the district and um, from around the world uh, in an effort to help the population just be more scientifically literate all around. Um, it's also worth noting too that our organization has been in, housed in DC um, since its inception. So looking forward to being neighbors and, um, and coming to this part of the city. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, so just to give a brief summary of what is being proposed, this is an existing office building at the corner of 8th and H Street Northwest. It's currently owned by Hillel, but as Kate mentioned, uh, Society for Science is a contract purchaser. Their intent is to renovate and modernize the existing building. This would consist of an interior fit out with no structural expansion. So the building as you see it is what will what will be there or will only be the interior. Uh, as part of that, a society has uh, come up with an idea to convert the existing P1 level. There's there's two parking levels underground. So the P1 level into usable office space that would connect to the ground floor. So as part of this modernization, um, that would be incorporated. And uh, the the crux of the of why we're requesting special exception relief from the BZA is the existing uh, parking it has 20 total spaces. So that's um, 10 total spaces on each uh, parking level. And by renovating and turning that P1 level into office space, we would be reducing the total number of parking down to 10 spaces. Which turns me to the uh, the request of the BZA. Uh, so under zoning, uh, the, the zoning requirement for this building is actually based on when the building was first constructed and when the office use first began which was under the prior version of the 1958 zoning regulations. So um, by reducing below what that requirement was, which was actually, um, uh, it was greater than 20 spaces, uh, I should say 12 spaces on site uh, and the eight in the, in the public vault space. So it was greater than that 12 on site uh, number. Um, we're actually required to seek relief, even though 
currently in the D5 zone under the 19, uh, 2016 zoning regulations, there's no parking requirement. So it's a bit of a unique scenario where there's no parking, as many of you might know, currently under zoning. But because we are kind of grandfathered under the previous zoning regulations, we have to request relief. So we believe we've met the, the board special exception standard, uh, in particular, uh, this excellent downtown location that's proximate to a number of public transit op um, opportunities, including the Metro, which is obviously only one block away at Gallery Place, uh, a number of bus lines, and then the extensive uh, bike infrastructure with a number of capital bike share stations nearby. Uh, our BZA hearing is scheduled for June 28th, um, and we will be working with the Department of Transportation on what's called a transportation demand management plan, which is a requirement under the zoning regulations whenever you ask for parking relief for more than uh, for a requirement that is less than four spaces under the requirement. So um, we certainly look forward to the BZA hearing. Uh, we think this is a fairly straightforward request, but certainly happy to answer any questions that anyone, uh, any commissioner or anyone in the public might have. Great, thank you very much. And and welcome to our, our neighborhood, um, for sure. Um, can you go back to the picture of the building? I'm, I'm familiar with the building, but um, you, you said P1 and P2, is P1 below grade? Yes, so both P1 and P2 are below grade. And actually, I have this up on my, uh, on Google Maps here. Um, the joys of a virtual presentation. So right, right. The, both parking levels are, are below grade. Uh, P1 is the first level below grade and both are accessed actually by a car elevator. Uh, so a little bit of a unique scenario there, but again, this car elevator, you drive into it and then drops you down to either the P1 and then below that, the P2 level. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And you would be taking the P1 level, converting that to office space, and just reducing the, basically cutting the, the parking. Well, you would just have 12 spaces instead of. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the parking count, I didn't mean to, I didn't want to confuse. So there's currently 20 total spaces. Yeah. And on each level. Okay. On, uh, of those 10, technically zoning only recognizes the six that are actually within the property line on each level. There's oh. also four in what's called vault space, which is public space. So which is for, like under the sidewalk. Yeah, exactly. So for a layman's purposes, there there will be 10 spaces. Zoning will see it as six on site and four in public vault space for a total of 10. Got it. That is great. And you are on a, yeah, I totally agree with you. You're on, you have such great transportation uh, there at that location and uh, easy access to Metro, et cetera. Um, and do you enter the garage on 8th, H, I'm sorry, 8th Street, 8th, 8th Street, H, 8th, H. <laughs> no, it's it's a tough one. Yes, this, yes. Is, uh, this is off 8th Street and for yeah. those who are unfamiliar, you've got the uh, the catwalk building, I'll call it, uh, up the street a little bit. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, I think that this is... Um, Can I just uh, ask a quick question? Yeah, please, please, right. please. <laughs> I know you're using, you're having to deal with uh, sort of being grandfathered into old zoning. Um, so how many parking spaces would be required under today's zoning? It's nothing, right? Zero. So having six, you're actually six in the good under current zoning policy. Correct. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that. I mean, I, I, I'm agreeing with what you're about to say, Commissioner Schenkel, which is I don't see an issue with saying, supporting this. Um, Got it. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I, I think uh, we have one question that has uh, arisen by Howard. I think you're on mute. There we go. I'm sorry. There you go. Yeah. So just wanted to, uh, as I look out my window right now, 
uh, I'm seeing your building. Uh, of course, we're very sad that Hillel International is leaving that site, but this is amazing that uh, you've moved in here and that's so important to our community, our Chinatown community that that be occupied that space with the, I'm a former journalist, so uh, know quite well about Scripps Howard newspapers and uh, the contributions they've made to American society and freedom of the press. So this is uh, awesome. Just giving a, a big shout out for this very positive development. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to move that we send a letter of uh, support for the uh, applicant's special exemption relief. Seconded. Chris, uh, Commissioner Rowe has seconded. Um, all those in favor? Raise your hand, four of four commissioners voting in favor of that. We will get that off for you. Thank you, we appreciate it. Thank awesome. you so much, and, and I just, appreciate your time. Most definitely. How many um, employees will you be bringing to the space? And where are you currently located? Maybe that's what I should ask too. Sure, we are currently located in two brownstones near the Tabard Inn on N Street in DuPont Circle. We've been in those buildings for about 84 years. Oh, wow. Um, and we have about 110 employees right now. 20, 25 of them are permanently remote. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we anticipate a good number. We're steady bringing people back to the office. We're going to start um, in fall with two days a week um, mandatory. So, awesome. we see traffic. We, we also want to host some of our student events there too. So, we'll yeah. have um, traffic from that, from those uh, events coming through as well. That is totally awesome. Well, that is great. Uh, we are happy to um, gain you, and I'm sure it's a loss for DuPont. Um, I would like to just add, if you are uh, putting in your policies two days a week in the office, uh, those two days, the people have to eat out um, and do lunch out in the community. <laughs> They had to go to the new Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I think they're really, you guys are really close to the new Chick-fil-A, um, right? Yep, they're really and, and happy they're hours. All those great work. restaurants. <laughs> I don't know about the students sure. having the happy hours, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Just kidding about that, by the way. That's <laughs> so all not, good. No, no, Delighted not, to support. I'm not criticizing the public record. It's just, it's just a little caveat there. <laughs> a quick question. Why the move uh, from, from, from DuPont since you've been there so long? Uh, what was driving this? What was motivating Our this organization change? has almost doubled in size in the last seven or eight years. And um, we went through an exhaustive process to uh, renovate the buildings and connect them there to totally, they're not, they don't party wall. Um, but then this mm -hmm. opportunity came up and it just seemed to make more sense for a lot of reasons economically mm -hmm. location um size right. awesome thank you excellent 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 um thank you so much we'll get that letter off for you great thank, thank you thank you appreciate you all have a good night thank you you too night. um next um we have uh, a late addition to our agenda and this is for uh ford's theater society at 512 10th street northwest um, this is something that's come before the ANC several times uh, previously, um, and I believe there is uh, a revised concept review that is underway by Historic Preservation, and I'd like to welcome uh, Sarah to the floor. So it's actually not Sarah. <laughs> oh, it's Sarah's what? Here too. My no, this is my mistake. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> So I'm I sorry, logged in with Sarah's login. So I'm actually Georgina Sperber with OTJ Architects. I'm principal gotcha. with OTJ Architects, the project manager. But Sarah is also on. I think you'll be just on here twice, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'm gotcha. here as well. I'm sorry, my camera doesn't seem to be working. Um, but uh, I'm going to let the architects take this presentation away. So. Fabulous, please. So thank you very much for squeezing us in. Um, we really appreciate it. We are a little bit under the wire. Um, I think, Commissioner Schenkel, you were here um, yes. when we came to the ANC for the second time. We, we yes. came, I think, originally in late 2018 or maybe early 2019 just to review the design before we went to HPRB. 
um, and the commissioners are very supportive of the design, and that was that was great. Um, and then I believe we came back again in late October of 2019 because we had um, some uh, BZA adjustments that we had to make for some setbacks at the rear of the property. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, the design had progressed a little bit by then. And, and again, um, thank you guys. You were very supportive of the design. Um, basically, what's happened since then is we went through this extensive entitlement process. We went through permitting. We had the project mobilized. We were under construction, basically. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic um, mm-hmm. hit us right at that as we were just getting get up. So early, um, you know, obviously March and then by May of 2020, um, the um, client, the Ford Theatre Society, made the decision to um, pause the project. And at that point, we didn't really know how long they were mm-hmm. going to pause it for, but we had the permit in hand and we were kind of, you know, we were like, are we good to go whenever we need to go? Um, and basically, it's been two and a half years that the project was on pause and they um, started it up again uh, late last year. And we've been, um, you know, we're looking at the budget, we're looking at the, sort of everything on the project, but we were able to kind of start construction because we were, we had the permit still in place because we extended it twice. Um, but as we got kind of later into the, the the year last year, as the numbers started coming in and kind of fine tuning them, um, there's been a lot of escalation, as you guys probably all are aware of in the market and um, particularly in, this, in the construction industry. And there was uh, something like 12% escalation escalation um in the budget and in looking at that um we've had to make some hard um budget decisions to try and bring the project back in line with with the budget that that Ford's theater society has for the project um and we're, we're looking at things that are not going to adversely impact their, pro- their their program um which is really I, I i don't know how much you remember or don't remember but their program basically supports sort of their whole mission it supports the theater supports the museum it supports the education program um and the, the this sort of addition to their campus is really going to help to support that so we kind of looked at things that are really more i want to say aesthetic rather than programmatic that we could we could cut um and they needed to be some quite big gestures so um the biggest um gesture is really getting rid of the architectural mesh screen element um on the front of the building um because that's going to yield quite a lot of some significant savings Um, and then other tweaks have been sort of less impactful I would say on the design Um, most of it has stayed pretty much the same Um, but I'm going to hand over to Chris Leonberg who's the director of design for OTG Architects for our studio and um, let Chris kind of give you a little recap of where we were and kind of be looking at now um, in the design process and Sarah I don't know if you want to add anything quickly before Chris goes. I think you covered it. We'll be going to the HPRB at the end of this month. Um, so we're really hoping to have the ANC support again as we as we move the project forward. But um, I think we can get into the design. Chris, if you want to go ahead. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sarah and uh, Georgina. And uh, thank you, uh, commissioners and uh, community members who are here. Um, so I will jump into kind of where we are with the design, as Georgina kind of mentioned. Um, I'm just going to kind of run back through some of the overview on the project, just as a you know, it's been I think three or four years since we've been here um, before you all. So um, this is kind of Ford's uh, campus on uh, on Tenth Street um, between E and F Street. Uh, so the building in question is this one here, labeled One. Um, that's Five Twelve Tenth Street, which is adjacent to um, their uh, 514 building, which is the Center for Education and Leadership, uh, which is next to the Peterson House. And then, of course, that's across the street from the Ford's Theater um, and then the associated um, expanded lobby to the north of that and then the Star Saloon to the south. So that kind of makes up the um, Ford's Theater uh, campus on uh, 10th Street. Um, this is the, the, the property um, 512 um, and 514, uh, the two adjacent properties have actually been subdivided um, into one record lot. So um, the, the two buildings are, are being considered as one um, as part of this uh, renovation and addition. Um, 
just kind of to overview the programming, um, this kind of explains, this is the existing building, um, or both are existing buildings, but this is the building that was previously renovated, um, 514, um, that is not being modified. Um, and then the 512 building, uh, which is what we were looking at uh, modifying and then building an addition on top of um, the first floor space is intended to be retail. Um, within that space, then we're gonna, there's going to be a studio space, which will be kind of a multi-purpose um, rehearsal and event space, um, a support floor with dressing rooms and uh, restroom facilities above that. And then the addition above that will have two floors. Um, the first floor is a function room kind of, again, a multi-purpose room for um, special events, um, dinners, things like that. And then another studio space is housed above that within mechanical above. Um, so uh, this is what uh, kind of the portion of 10th Street looked like, um, you know, before the renovation. Um, the building behind kind of the second bus there is, is um, 512 10th Street. Um, this was the design we previously um, came uh, to, to you all with and, and presented to HBRB and received approval for. Um, kind of overview, uh, we're pretty much preserving the historic facade as it is, um, pretty minimal changes to it. Um, the main changes are down at the ground level, um, mainly to open up that ground level facade to make it more open and inviting pedestrians coming by um, opening up, there's currently a step up, several steps up into that space. We're kind of creating that space to be at, at grade. Um, so you can walk right in and more open with more glazing. Um, and then introducing a canopy at that element that ties in with the canopy um, on the 514 building. Um, and then the, the kind of more significant change is the addition above. Um, and this kind of bronze element you're seeing here is, is that screening element that we mentioned. Um, so. Uh, I'm gonna let's see. There we go. Uh, jumping ahead. So this is this is kind of the proposed revised design. Um, everything I mentioned down here at the existing building uh, is remaining unchanged. So it's really just a change um, from how the outward appearance of the uh, addition building looks. Um, so as you can see, we've removed that screening element, um, and really we're you know, as, as this is being done as a cost saving measure, uh, we're really trying to be um, careful with any additional changes we make. So um, what you're seeing here is is kind of the screen removed and we uh, kind of modified the design of the underlying elements, which were a combination of glass and metal panels on the southern facade um, and just modified them to make uh, to work together a little more harmoniously. Um, with one another, modified some of the panelization of that um, elements you didn't previously see um, to kind of make it a, a, a more um, compatible expression with the rest of the elements um, and, you know, kind of allowing the glazing on this portion to tie in with some of the other glazing and then the, this kind of side elevation um, to have a relationship to the metal panels on the building below and then the adjacent building. Um, and then just very quickly, just to show you a couple of views. This is the view of that, uh, what it would look like at night. Um, we did introduce a, a frosted glazing on a portion of, um, this was previously a frosted glazing. We introduced a bit more of it here to kind of reduce um, the effect of that as kind of a glowing um, element or the, the perception that that might, um, that, that, that might kind of uh, detract from the, the adjacent um, buildings. Um, and then we just wanted to show a couple of views of, of kind of what it looked like previously um, and then the current design from a couple of different angles. So here we are kind of from the south. Um, we have another view um, kind of mid block sort of across the street at Ford's Theater Society um, and then up the block. Um, and, and I think the point to make here is that as you as you move up the block, the addition pretty much entirely disappears. Um, and that hasn't changed uh, with this new uh, new design. Um, and then these are just some examples of what the different materials look like, um, some actual photographs. So this is the upper image is a photograph of the uh, metal panels that we're proposing. Um, and then the glazing, um, both on the left is the uh, kind of vision glazing and then the frosted glazing, which has a translucent film applied to it. Um, both of those are with a, a kind of butt glazed approach um, application so you don't see, you know, there's just a, a pretty minimal line. There's not a, an expressed mullion with, with this design. Um, 
And these are just uh, the images here on the, the right hand side are just um, photographs of the actual material samples in some different lighting conditions to give a sense of what those materials look like. Um, and so with that, that's that's kind of a summary of the design changes. Um, and we'd be happy to hear any questions or comments. Um, so just um, two questions for you. Um, the the setback, I can't remember this, the, the previous uh, request is, is the setback within alignment of uh, of the uh, BZ, uh, the, B, the zoning commission. So yes. Yeah. Good. I was just going to say so that it, it, the setback at the front and the sides are all in compliance, but at the back on the alley side, we were not in compliance. That that That's that was what we got a, a, a zoning adjustment for, because um, we could because there's an elevator and basically. If we were to do that, then the whole new building sort of wouldn't be functional. Right, right. Um, so right, they, exactly. they agreed with that. And it didn't have any visual impacts on the adjacent buildings because there's an alley and it's sort of set back from those. So right. it, it, that, that, was, that was the part that was not in compliance. And the beautiful tile over the front of the building, um, historical tile, that's going to be untouched as far as... Or is it going to be re like down there? Yes. Yes. Uh, so so that is is remaining. Um, Jordina, I don't know if you want to talk about how those are being restored, the, the metal yeah. panels on the existing building. Yes. Oh, they're metal. Oh, they're wow. metal. They um I think they basically got a sort of baked enamel on them, I believe. Oh. But they are going to be um removed and sort of documented as to where each one comes from and then um restored off site and then brought back and reinstalled but that the, in, the intention that they, they're going to remain for all intents and purposes right. the colors will haven't been fully determined yet because we still need to yeah. do a little more um analysis on that to figure out what you know they faded over time and that sort yeah. of thing so of um i can't can't 100 comment on what the colors are going to be yeah. but we are going to investigate that and and they will be restored got it and the the other uh piece that I recall previously um, was the 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 grade on the front that you were um, attempting to kind of level the grade between the two because it's on a pretty steep angle there right. the sidewalk is that that's still in play so what we what we what we are trying to do is we're trying to meet um, the grade that's in that existing 514, that that grade level, so that that can all be sort of one level retail space. Right. But to be able to do that, we actually come in at what our grade is at that sidewalk there. And then there also, there's sort of a lower level and some steps and a ramp. But the most of that retail space is once you get beyond the steps and the ramp up, you basically at that, that, that 514. I don't, Chris, I don't know if you can flip to the plan quickly. That might oh, be sure. Random. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there's about a two foot difference, I think, between the two, yeah. right, Chris? It's something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is lower. This indicate where the vestibule is, and then these steps bring you up to the same level gotcha. as the adjacent building. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I think uh, all things considered, the removal of that. Uh, mesh to help reduce the cost and some other small modifications uh, really is a, a good um, alternative to the process. Um, so I, uh, commissioners, do you have any questions? Go ahead. I, I just had a quick question. Um, the removal of the mesh, that's just an aesthetic change. It doesn't change like the environmental efficiency of the building or <clears throat> anything like that you're still going to be yeah, no, we, whatever those requirements are which i promise you i don't know <laughs> no they that's a very it's actually a very very good question because we did have to run those numbers again to make sure that are we meeting you know that the hvac system didn't have to change and that we're still meeting the energy um the green code requirements but a lot of the um the energy control is actually with the film on the glass so actually the, the okay 
we're 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 okay. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank you. I was just curious so, about that because it's a, no, it's a great it's a great question. I'm in a building with a lot of glass windows at my office, and it can be a little toasty in the afternoon. <laughs> right, and Thank actually, you. on the the lower windows, we do have actually sh have uh, shades on those windows just at at the client's request because even though it meets the energy code, they don't want mm -hmm. in those lounge spaces excessive amounts of light coming in because they've. They've, they Thank experienced you. that in the five foot in the adjacent building. So they, they've kind of learned their lesson a little bit. Right. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? How much did, the, did this save you? Like you said, you did this to, to cut down on costs. How much did you save by removing that mesh facade? So the numbers are still being crunched, but the rough order of magnitude is about a half a million. So, really? Just the facade? Yeah. It's so it's not it's not just it's not because it's only the mesh it's because the mesh is obviously supported on a steel frame and it has architectural right. lighting that uh, you know lights it and electrical that supplies that and controls and all that stuff so there are a lot of other components that kind of it's not like just the mesh but there 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 were a significant number of things associated with that screen oh. that yielded those potentially it's too bad. I think savings. that I have that, you know, that would have that would have been kind of pretty cool to see, I guess, but got a pencil out. Yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's a, it's not a, it's been a hard, you know, we, we, we kind of did a lot of back and forth from December through probably late January, February before we kind of really got to things that were yielding enough savings to get us. They, they, it's not a, an easy, uh, obviously an easy decision for for Ford State. Right. I think they're just trying to hold on to as it much wasn't of, necessary. of their actual yeah. program that they can without compromising, right. you know, without compromising that and what they're trying to do in the in the spaces inside. Yeah. We have, I mean, just you you don't you can't see it. The other element that we eliminated was that on the mechanical level, they had wanted to have a roof terrace up there. Um just more for, for the sort of staff rather than the one that's down below at the function room level. Um, and that that had pavers and um, it had to have a second means of egress and stuff like that. And so that also is a big element that's been uh, um, eliminated now. So that's just a mechanical level now. Um, so they've been, I, we didn't present that just because it's not, it was never really visible uh, from a design, but that's another something that wasn't going to really impact their program per se it was just sort of a nice thing for them to have and to offer their the staff that worked in the building but they're not going to be able to at this point do that so that's another sort of hard decision that they've had to make yes this is uh but i'm happy the project is is moving forward that's great um any other community questions or any other questions go ahead thomas you're on mute Uh, we had a headset die. Uh, is anything happening on top of that red building, or is it uh, simply HVAC equipment up there? The red building. Yeah. Um, yeah. There. That that's it, I, I, an adjacent property, uh, yeah. which which is not owned by Fort Cedar Society. Okay. Right. So nothing. <laughs> no, we're not doing anything up there. I guess would be the the best way to answer it. It's actually okay. it's it, it's the field office right now. We're renting the top floor, but um, <laughs> I don't think there's I I I don't think there's much HVAC equipment on that roof. If I just I'm trying to remember. I know there are like some chimneys and some mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. vents that come up, but I don't think there's any big air handling. Mm -hmm. equipment on that roof from what I recall I, I might be wrong mm -hmm. it probably smells like pancakes <laughs> yeah <laughs> like a shop. if mm -hmm. you were both it would be awesome I like to move that we send a letter of support um for um the uh h p b r revised concept review for Ford's theater society at uh, 512 10th Street Northwest. So our second. Thomas, are you seconding? Second. Okay. Yes. 
Thomas is seconding. And all those in favor, if you could raise your hand. Awesome. So I have Thomas, are you up for four and four? Okay, mm -hmm. four and four. Got it. Okay. Four and four. So that passes. And we will uh get off a letter of support. You mentioned the end of the month. Do you have a date scheduled? I'm assuming sure you do. Yeah. So the meeting scheduled for May 25th. Um Got the it. Continuation meeting is on June 1st. I don't think I put this in the email, but uh, the case number is the same as it previously was. It's 19 100. So um, 19 it might be helpful for the letter. 100. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. I will get that over to you and I'll copy you on that. Right. Well, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Look thank forward everyone. to this great concept coming to life. Thank you. Thank you so That's much. Good. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. All right. Um, three more items of business this evening. Um, this should be uh, fairly uh, easy. Um, let me just get my screen sharing. I just where's my screen share go. There we go. Number that I have. That's interesting. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Oh, here it is. I had everything except for what I, I needed here. Um, we want to talk about uh, Taco Bell Cantina at 808 7th Street uh, Northwest and the installation of new signage. Um, this is coming. Um, as part of the Chinatown, the Office of Planning and the Chinatown uh, Review Committee. And I, is that one I'm showing? <laughs> Am I showing the, the Zoom thing? Or are you, are you looking at the Chinatown Review application? You are, okay, got it, got it. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through this. Um, this is um, uh, the new uh, Taco Bell Cantina that is going in on the first floor of the um, of the space. Um, it's taking the old Irish bar place, right? Irish bar place. Yep. So it's going to look a little different. I'm going <laughs> to screens here for you. Um, so um, this will be uh reconfigured it will be painted uh this uh purplish color um here um which is the taco bell color um they um are attaching a bell like a pin mounted metal bell uh to the entrance way the doorway that is kind of, um, you know, to the left of the door there. Um, and they will be using uh, Taco Bell, of course, the name, uh, which will be affixed to the wall there. Uh, they have the Chinese letters. Um, hopefully that means something of Taco Bell. Thomas, what, do, what, do, what is your translation? For us, it, that's just like a uh, phonetical transliteration, but that's fine. Oh, yeah. Okay, got it. Um, I don't think taco is a Chinese word. No, not a bit. And uh, cantina will be um, on there as well, underneath the the bell on the front, the verbiage um, as well. Um, Chinatown does require there to be a blade signs. Um, on the restaurant so they stick out from the building which will be the taco bell symbol and cantina mm -hmm. um with that the and if you go back to the let me just go back here to the uh, design here um some of the design elements that um we have is that um there's the chinese letters um the the blade sign and that it will fit into the community aesthetic which i think that it it will um in this, in this sense are there any questions or 
comments. Michael, is that bell lit up, or is that just the? Is it lit up somehow, or is it just? Uh... Let's see what it says. Oh, it's just a pin. Illuminated. Oh, it's illuminated, backlit, halo, halo. white. Okay. Which is kind of a unique uh, there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I have no objections. Me neither. Me neither. I move that we send a, do we have to send a letter of support here? Is that what we do? Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, I'm going to move that we send a letter of support to approve this signage. Mm -hmm. I Second. oh, seconded by Commissioner Strauss. Yay. Um, all those in favor? So four of four commissioners voting in favor of that. Um, the next piece that we have, uh, what did I do with my next piece here? Please stand by. I have it over here, right on. Um, So this is, this is in um, your neck of the woods, I believe, Commissioner. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, this is at 600 Massachusetts. Is that even us? Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just <laughs> puzzled all of a sudden as oh. I read that address. Let me just make sure that I'm not I'm um I'm not sure that's our ANC, but um let me just uh, let me just do a quick a search here because I I thought I did that a minute a little while ago and it was, but let me just see. It was previously, so this might be 600. Um, Northwest. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> it is still in our area. Okay. It must be you then. <laughs> it is me. It is me. I, I was thinking that it was me. <laughs> Um, so, but, um, okay, this is at Founding Farmers and Distillers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to project here. I'm sorry, folks. Okay, this is a sign change um, that they are making. Um, they are changing from farmers and distillers to founding farmers and distillers. Um, so there's a, a, a couple of, of changes, as you can see in the signage. Um, they added the distillers below the, the main header, and uh, they moved the Chinese letters down below above the, the uh, entrance door there. Very strange that they decided to keep that picture with the guy walking in there. Okay, that's fine. Um, so they are, um, you basically see the signage there um, that they have with the letterings that they're using, which are fairly uh, standard. I don't necessarily, um, the, the letters, are illuminated, including the Chinese letters? No, though I'm sorry, they are not illuminated. The Chinese letters are not illuminated on the sign. They are just uh, affixed to the glass below it. But my bed. Um, and they are affixing the sign. This is on the side of the building, I believe. Um, 
the farmers and distillers, which replaces, I believe, the um, blade sign concept uh, that they have um, on the side of the building. Um, I have 13. Thoughts. I'm assuming this is a, just to sort of brand them with their parent restaurant in West End. Uh, um, no, at the Farmers, I think. Uh, does it, because of the blade sign thing you said about uh, Taco Bell, is it out of compliance with what is required? Or no, since they're not downtown Chinatown, they're okay? No, I think it's fine because they're on a corner and mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. advertising on the other side of the corner. Um, the one thing that I, I do want to say is that the Chinese letters are not on the blade. Mm -hmm. but I guess it does not have to be on the blade when it's on the side. I guess they're not on the blade typically. Mm -hmm. I, I'm okay with this change. Um, What are your thoughts? Me too. I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to move that we send a letter of support for founding farmers. Illuminated on raceway. Um, Michael, what does illuminated letters on raceway mean? Illuminated letters on raceway. That means they stick out. There's those little bars that are behind the letters. When you see letters that kind of stick out from the wall or the sign. I see. Oh, I see. I said, oh, sorry. Yep, go ahead. I was just seconding your letter of support. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. so four of four commissioners voting in favor of that. Awesome. And uh, we will now move forward um, to for our last item of business tonight. Uh, which is related uh, to the balanced gym uh, conversion. And I know that Mr. Strauss, did you want to leave this part? Well, I just know that, that Nancy, she sent us emails saying that she had found new information that they had confirmed that it will be a shelter. It's already been rezoned to be a shelter. It's a done deal. Nancy, you want to? Also yeah, I, I, I just in the last couple of days got a barrage of forwarded emails from the owner of, of my building uh, mm -hmm. and their local D.C. attorney that show um, email traffic going way back into 2022 when this block used to be in, I guess, 2F. Okay. Um, and the, just within the last week or so, there are emails from uh, Deputy Mayor Turnage directly saying, it, but it's already zoned. And so there's no, the only input is how can we make this successful, which I'm kind of taken aback by. I don't know how any of these things work. I'm new to all of this. I don't even know how to check. Wait, you mean how to make zoning. it successful, like successful as a shelter? Yes. Yes. Whatever it is they decide to do, it's now our job to make it successful. That... Without any our job, without any impact, any input from all of the different kinds of stakeholders on the block, we're going to have to live with this. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I'm just confused by all this. And uh, I happened to be in an event last week that uh, Brooke Pinto was sp speaking at. And she actually came up and addressed me by name, which was startling, um, and said. Is it, I really think the balance gym should be a, a senior center. What do you think of that? And so we chatted for a minute and I said, I'd send her an email, but then I started getting this other stuff. And so now I, I, I don't know how to constructively move forward or whether there's any point in, or whether we should just wait for the, well, for the train to run us over. I mean, I think, you know, we can try to suggest a different use. We can also try to do other improvements to the alley. Uh, whether that's murals, whether that's improving lighting, whether like there are a lot of things we could do so that, you know, it can be successful, you know, you know for everybody. Um, so then maybe we can discuss like what, what our ideas could be for that alley, you know, and how to get that done. 
Um, and it probably is also a good sort of show of force. Like we care about the alley. We want it to be something the whole community embraces um, and not kind of like a dark, dangerous place. Yeah, and um, given, given the, the ongoing violence and criminal activity through almost all of 2022, the, the, the shooting at the encampment mm -hmm. in May, and then we had a shootout the overnight, like second or third of November by, by people who had barricaded themselves inside. So mm -hmm. we continue to see, uh, certainly not as much as during the encampment, but we, it, it's still a trafficked place at night mm -hmm. and, and uh, activity continues. Have you talked to the Green Lantern? Uh, no, not yet. I was hoping to have some kind of like block. I do that. Okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start talking to the people in that alley. To, to have okay. yeah, and and the Arepa zone the is right is right on that alley, and you know other the Alta condominium backs onto that alley. It's not just right. us. We should have a larger meeting with everybody. That's what I'm asking. Who has for. right? Who has interest on the alley? Okay. I'll, and the, I'll, ac I'll the access to the building itself, I don't think people understand that the that the driving access to our employee parking garage takes up. You know, I can see that easily being obstructed. That our staff wouldn't be able to get into and out of our parking. Right. It, it, the whole the whole site is so tight and landlocked. Yeah. Um. I didn't have the chance. I read through most of what you sent, uh, but I had to work up until the meeting started. Um, so I didn't have a chance to, to digest all of it. But when we had um, HHS on here with us in either February or March, we asked very specifically about this site. And we were told very specifically that it had not been determined because I believe, and I know that uh, Pablo is no longer on the call, but when I met with Pablo, we talked about potentially an LGBTQ site there. And we, we actually did talk in our meeting about, because both Becky and I, Commissioner Strauss and I were both members of Balanced Gym, so we know exactly what it's like <laughs> to try to walk through that alley yeah. um, and not get hit by a car rolling out of one of the five parking garages. Plus, there's a new building a that's new, being built. Yeah, um, building. The, yeah. The, con the construction so trucks, more, uh, the construction trucks back there are, are, are just... Well, <laughs> I think we should reach out to the deputy mayor turnage and, and try to have a call. Um, I'm happy to be on that. I know it's not my SMD, but. Um, so so <laughs> one, of my, one of my naive questions is, is it actually zoned as a shelter? Can they just arbitrarily do that? How could it have been in actual use as a gym <laughs> and now somehow be zoned as a shelter? How does that work? I'm sure, it's a lot easier when it, the city owns it. <laughs> Yeah, um, but I, I also think I think what's a done deal is that it's going to be used by DHS for something. So it's sort of like a shelter, but what kind of shelter, right? If it's a senior facility, probably be for low income seniors. If it's for LGBTQ, it'd be for unsheltered LGBTQ folks. So um, I think that ship has sailed. Yeah, I, I think we would be most happy with a day program or a non congregate housing. Uh, SRO of some sort or permanent supportive housing would be awesome. Um, We're just alarmed at the thought of it being an, an emergency transition overnight shelter right. without other services there. Um, Nancy, um, do you know how, how your building person came to get this? They have a DC attorney that's been emailing uh, various people, in, including Deputy Mayor Turnage, and oh. some of the some of the emails were answers back to oh. the corporate owner's attorney. Gelman is their attorney in DC. Gelman is the attorney for for Bridge Investment Group, which owns my building. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that that makes. Okay, that makes Bridge Investment Group is a huge conglomerate, and they have a seniors housing division of which we're one of 110 properties. Got it. So, so this uh, Alan Gelman or Jeffrey Gelman, yes, is with you guys, and um, okay, and um, Allison Ramirez, who forwarded it to me, is the Bridge staff person who's responsible for my 
property. Got it. This is good. 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 Good to know. Okay. Um, okay. I um, I think that. Uh, what? Well, what I want to do is just organize that meeting with all the stakeholders yeah. and hear what people want and think about like how we could ask for or get the wheels moving on improvements to make the alley better. Right. Um, Certainly safer for pedestrians, no matter what right. use it is. It's going to yeah. need to be a lot safer with better signage and, and right at the access right of way to my building's employee parking. Uh, you know, all of that needs to be addressed, certainly, as an improvements of the site. Okay. Michael, what were you going to say? No, I'm just... Um, uh, I wonder how... Uh, uh, I see that... Um, well, 2F is... is um, I believe a completely new commission as far as commissioners. I, I don't believe there's any body who was in the former commission that moved over. Um, there's a bunch of emails from a Janice Faraby, I, MSW. She, I she's she, at the downtown bid. Okay. She was the like ANC services. commissioner from 2018 to 2020. Oh, she was. She was. Oh. So, um, so but she is not anymore, but she is now with the downtown bid um, homeless outreach uh, services, I believe. Okay. I don't think she knows that any of, of what's happened recently, but certainly there's a lot of outrage emails from her. Well, from we should last year. We should include her. In we should loop her into yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Because this is, we're in the downtown bid, you know. Oh, so, right. My, yes. my block, your block, your, your building. Yeah. Right. So I um, would uh, like to, um, I think that we should send a letter, a formal letter to uh, Deputy Mayor Turnage and um, DHS Zellinger um, about this and um, expressing our concerns that this pe appears to be moving without community engagement again. Thank and you. It needs to stop until we have some more, until- We need to be at the table. Yeah. yeah Mr. We need to be at the table. Can I suggest that we also include um, Anthony Newman and Shaquin Greer on that letter because they're the um, department of, they're the DHS folks who are doing the shelter here, the Pat Handy swing space. Mm -hmm. And so we've been interacting with them a lot and they have been really talking a big game about transparency and accountability. Um, so it would be good to include them because they might be able to help us answer some questions. Is that okay by you guys if we copy them on that? Yes. Because they're both involved in that kind yeah, of project. Because um, I think this is important for us to get ahead of this now so that we don't end mm -hmm. up in a situation like <laughs> we were with 11th Street Pat Handy. Well, and I think that's why if we copied them because they have been the ones sort of, let's just say taking the, the dropped bombs from the neighborhood about it. I yes. think that they might have some investment in, in helping us move this forward a bit. Awesome. And not, not to nag, but my, I live in a building of completely vulnerable people. Yes, so. yeah. That's not nagging. We, 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 we're aware of that and we'll make sure that we include that in the letter. Who've, who've already been very traumatized and negatively impacted by the violence of last year. Right. Yes. And balance is actually still there with a personal training space that um, fronts uh, 14th, right? On the, on right. The 14th Street side. So and we would want to include them as well. Um, uh, on the email chain, well, I, I did some Google map uh, um, marking. Yes, I saw that. It was pretty good, man. I don't know why you're apologizing. I thought that was good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Boomer right. level of tech. Um, so I'd like <laughs> to move that we send a letter of support to. <clears throat> 
letter uh, requesting some info. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Turnage and others named here. Um, Con concern? Concern. Let us Letter of concern. concern. There you go. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Sorry. Okay. And all those in favor? So four four voting in favor of that. Also, we will get that okay. off, Nancy, and hopefully get what appears to be going off the rails back on track. <laughs> That'd be nice. And you'll include me and and Janice Therapy from the downtown bid. Yep. yep. Exactly. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for June 13th um, at 6 p.m. Um, I don't believe there's any other uh, pieces of business this evening. I would like to move that we adjourn our meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second. Um, <laughs> done, done, done. second that one. <laughs> done, done, done. Okay, this is awesome. Well, thank you all so very much. Uh, we appreciate you being here with us. Thank you. And we'll see you in June. We'll see thank you in you June. Be well. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye. Good night.